This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. And now we're going to, I think, move slightly further east um, with Matthew Jones and JFK China and Nuclear Arms. Thank you, Ron. Um, and thank you to Luke and Matthew as well. Um, in January 1963, President Kennedy told, told André Malraux, the French Minister of Culture, that China was the real menace facing the international scene over the coming decade. Relations with the Soviet Union, Kennedy said, could be contained within the framework of mutual awareness of the impossibility of achieving any gains through war. But in the case of China, this restraint would not be effective because the Chinese would be perfectly prepared because of the lower value they attach to human life, to sacrifice hundreds of billions of their own lives if this were necessary in order to carry out their militant and aggressive policies. The prospect, this prospect of a communist China armed with nuclear weapons and prepared to expand its revolutionary message across Asia, I think it is possible to say, haunted Kennedy, particularly during the final year of his presidency. Along with an emergent detente with the Soviet Union, which was itself linked to developments in Sino-Soviet relations and the gathering of crisis in Vietnam, it was the coming of a Chinese nu- nuclear capability that formed one of the key background themes to the US foreign policy during 1963. With nuclear weapons, some fear, China could directly attack US bases or allies in East Asia, <coughs> use them as an umbrella beneath which they could foster the insurgency, while they gave prestige to China and the Chinese Communist movement. A Chinese bomb would break the Occidental monopoly on nuclear weapons. In the wider sphere of public opinion, to many Americans, Red China was violent, unreasoning, unstable, and relentlessly hostile. It was China that helped to fuel insurgency in Southeast Asia, directed a remorseless barrage of anti-imperialist propaganda, US involvement in the developing world, and which, had, and which had to be not only contained, but also isolated. And of course, this was seen in the bans on Americans traveling to China and on US trade with China um, during the 1950s and 1960s, and of course in the non-recognition policy of China. Within the United States, public attitudes towards China as an enemy were also changing as they taught that the Soviet Union became more of a feature of great power relations after 1962. In early 1964, one report considered by George Bundy, President uh, Kennedy's national security advisor, which detailed the results of interviews conducted with the wide geographical spread of Americans the previous autumn, so in autumn 63, revealed that China was now viewed as a bigger threat to world peace than Russia. <coughs> Fear of war with the Soviet Union was declining, but respondents could see a nuclear-armed China as posing more of a danger in the future. In 1961, the same survey had shown that about 5% talking about a Chinese threat, quote, in terms of a racial struggle or as a conflict between Western and, Occident- and Oriental civilizations. But this figure had risen to 20%, almost 20% of those interviewed by the autumn of 1963. Perhaps most remarkably, it was also <coughs> concluded that somewhere between a quarter and a third of the sample were, quote, moving mentally towards an impossible eventual alliance of the United States with Russia against Red China. Overall, the public was pictured as lacking confidence with how China's growing strength could be addressed, while, quote, deep in their minds lies the thread that Red China is moving inexorably towards a nuclear racial war, and that so far we do not know what to do to change this drift of events. And I think Kennedy personally shared many of these kinds of sentiments. So what I want to do in the time I've got is, first of all, I want to talk about Kennedy's attitude towards China and his Chinese acquisition of nuclear weapons in 1963. And then secondly, I want to talk about the implications this might have, or this Chinese acquisition of nuclear weapons had, for American military posture, more generally in Asia, um, across this period. So JFK and the Chinese bomb. As early as the spring of 1961, Kennedy was talking, so the New York Times colonist Arthur Kropp later recalled, of the need to continue the test ban negotiations at Geneva with the Soviet Union because of an intense trip desire to do everything possible to assure that communist China won't have a bomb. The President's belief in the dire political consequences of the Chinese bomb even led him to doubt that holding the line in Vietnam would, ultimately, be an effective counter to Beijing's ambitions. Asked if he believed in the domino theory later that same year, he replied that he doubted the theory really worked anymore because, quote, the Chinese communists are bound to get nuclear weapons in time, and from that moment on, they will dominate Southeast Asia. In the autumn of 1962, two events in particular seemed to have excited Kennedy's geopolitical imagination 
and gave him added cause for alarm over Chinese behaviour. One was the Sino-Indian border war, which to Kennedy at least seemed to indicate that Beijing was entering a newly confident and aggressive phase, with its assault on South Asia's main non-communist power and seen as a threat to regional stability. India, of course, also had a good relationship with the Soviet Union, giving the border war an important resonance to Sino-Soviet relations as well. As the ideological struggle between Beijing and Moscow to control the world communist movement reached a new intensity, the militancy of Chinese propaganda and rhetoric picked up, attacking both the revisionism of the Soviet system on the Khrushchev and actively, actively promoting the revolutionary struggle against the imperialism. In Southeast Asia, the Chinese began to build links with the Indonesian Communist Party, and arms supplies to Hanoi were begun following an initial request from Hanoi in the autumn of 1962. To so the Kennedy administration, China seemed determined to spread its influence in Asia, if given a chance, adding to the imperative need to prevent Beijing attaining nuclear capability. The current phase, the President warned the visiting Japanese trade delegation, was a period of great danger for Asia. This is from 1962, this quote. Where Japan and the United States should work as partners against the communist movement, quote, which is in its essence today a believer in not only the class struggle, but also in the international class struggle of the Third World War. Unquote. The second event that excited Kennedy, I think, was the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the Chinese response to the resolution of the crisis was to lambast the Soviet climb down, as it was portrayed, as if global nuclear war were a preferable outcome or alternative outcomes of the crisis. With the settlement of the Cuban crisis, it seemed that rational dialogue leading to agreement with Moscow was eminently possible at least so, 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 so many US policy makers thought. And this went back to an earlier theory voiced by people like George Kennan, for example, that essentially the Russians could be civilized. They had a link back to Western civilization. As the Americans came to see it, the Russians might be dangerous adversaries, but they were also essentially pragmatic realists who did not want competition with the West to turn into all-out war, and who would bring, which would bring disastrous consequences for everyone. But when it came to the Chinese, no such dialogue seemed possible. Or as Kennedy told one news conference in December 1962, the Chinese communists believe that if war comes, a nuclear third world war, they can survive it anyway with 750 million people. And of course, this impression of Chinese indifference to human suffering was given um, some extra um, um, purchase, if you like, by, of course, the contemporary events of the, um, of the Great Leap Forward and the famine of the famine the mass famine that was seen in the Australian countryside. How much more dangerous will such a regime become if it actually possessed nuclear weapons? A Chinese nuclear program had been underway since the late 1950s. And though assessments differed, there was a wide assumption that by the early, in the early 1960s, that in a few years' time, Beijing would actually be in a position to test its first device. Now, Kennedy obviously took this threat very seriously. And he signals his determination to move toward a nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviet Union as a way to inhibiting Chinese nuclear development. In fact, he made clear that considering the domestic political capital that would cost him in securing passage of the test ban treaty, were it not, not for the prospect of a Chinese bomb, he would drop the whole idea of the test ban negotiations with the Chinese. To the National Security Council in January 1963, Kennedy avowed that Chinese communists loom as our major antagonists in the late 1960s and beyond. Over the test ban, as he put it, if the Soviets want this, and if it can help in keeping the Chinese communists from getting full nuclear capability, then it is worth it. We can't foresee what the world will be like with this, which I am on. We can't afford to let them do it. The following month, in February 63, Kennedy had acknowledged the likelihood that the Russians would cheat over the provisions of a test ban. Consider that extremely possible that the, China, the Russians would actually cheat on the provisions of a test ban. But this was still worth going ahead with the treaty because of the, of the potential effect on the China bomb. So how would a test ban treaty affect this prospect of the Chinese bomb? Wasn't this an example of wishful thinking? Well, the, the, the way the American administration was thinking um, about the test ban was that the conclusion of the test ban would make it politically much more difficult to justify uh, continued testing by the Chinese Communist government. There was even an outside hope that the Soviet Union might somehow persuade the Chinese to come into a test ban regime eventually, or at least give the, China, uh, the Russians more options in order to frustrate the Chinese program for the negotiation of the test ban regime. But secondly, of course, negotiation of the test ban regime also held out the prospect of developing a community of interest between Washington and Moscow over present, preventing Chinese acquisition of a nuclear capability, and also to present opportunities and possibilities for joint action against the Chinese program, or at least the Russians turning a blind eye if the Americans chose to take action against the Chinese program. And thanks to the work of, for example, Gordon Chang, Bill Burr, Jeffrey Richardson, Richardson, we now know, of course, that the 
um, Americans were thinking about the possibility of a uh, military action of some kind against the site of nuclear facilities in 1963 and 1964. When Abel Harriman went to Moscow in July 63 to negotiate the Test Ban Treaty with Khrushchev, he went, and, he went armed and equipped with the idea from Kennedy that he should hint to Khrushchev that there might be the possibility of joint action against these Chinese nuclear facilities. Or at least there could be trade-offs in the field of non-proliferation. So if the Russians agreed that the Chinese shouldn't be allowed to develop nuclear weapons, then perhaps the West could also prevent West Germany from developing nuclear weapons or gaining control in some way of nuclear weapons. So there might be some kind of grand bargain here. People like Mark Trapton will have talked about. But of course, Harriman's overtures in Moscow come to nothing, which is a very interesting pursuit. And the Chinese come to denounce the partial test ban treaty as it becomes, as designed to preserve the existing monopoly of the nuclear powers. The test ban, the Chinese say, were not halting your arms race and left the non nuclear powers no means to defend themselves. The Calls for dismantling all US bases in the Western Pacific followed from Beijing and is accompanied by calls for the withdrawal of all American nuclear weapons from the region and the creation of nuclear free zones. Despite the rejection of Harriman's overtones, um, Overtures in Moscow, Kennedy still believed there might exist a shared interest with the Soviet Union preventing the Chinese bomb. And on the 1st of August 1963, he gave voice to his continuing fears when he pronounced at the presidential news conference that in a decade's time, the China with 700 million people and a Stalinist regime which was, quote, determined on war as a means of bringing about its ultimate success and equipped with nuclear weapons would present the United States with, quote, a situation more dangerous than the end of the Second World War. I do find it very interesting the language that's employed by Kennedy on some of his advisors at the time. Very kind of, I was trying to think of the right phrase, but it's like apocalyptic demographics. Hundreds of millions of Chinese. It's this kind of vision of hundreds of millions of Asians or hundreds of millions of Chinese, which is constantly recycled. It reminds me very much of some of the, you know, the white supremacist literature of the 1920s, like the Bob Stoddard's writing, writing time of color and so on and so forth. But I think that's an interesting area to pursue. So the second area of what I wanted to cover here, um, the consequences of Chinese nuclear capability. How did they affect American thinking about their defense posture in Asia? Now, during 1962-63, the Kennedy administration undertook a little notice but a highly revealing review of its nuclear posture in the Far East as it related to the possibility of the occurrence of limited war perhaps involving China. The review arose from the desire to make savings in overseas defense spending, it's the kind of savings that was talked about this morning in the paper in Vietnam, by withdrawing conventional forces from Korea, a step which General Maxwell Taylor, and Taylor was soon to become Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, favored. And Taylor went on a tour of the Far East in September 1962, just before he took over the job of uh, Chairman of JCS. And he came back with these ideas that you can actually pull back and reduce um, American conventional strength in Korea. But if you were to do so, you'd have to accompany this step, however, with an extra or more overt emphasis on the very early use of nuclear weapons in the event of communist aggression. You'd have to be very much more explicit about what you would do if the North Koreans, with possible support from the Chinese, chose to attack. In the Far East, in many respects, the attractions of tactical nuclear use in limited war seemed even greater by the early 1960s. <coughs> and so with the advent of the Sino-Soviet split, it seemed increasingly unlikely that Moscow would come to Beijing's aid if the Chinese committed aggression into Korea or the Taiwan Strait and were faced with limited use of nuclear weapons by the United States. This distinction was acknowledged when Kennedy, Robert McNamara, and Taylor discussed the Korean proposal in September 1962. When Kennedy pointed out that adopting a stance involving rapid escalation to tactical nuclear use in Korea, representing in some senses a reversal of the emphasis in Europe, McNamara agrees, agreed, saying, I think the conditions are reversed. In Europe, the reason our strategy is, it, it is as it is, is because we're faced with a nuclear force, and a very strong one, i.e. the Soviet Union. In China, we have no nuclear force opposing us. And it seems to me this is enough of a difference to warrant at least consideration of a different strategy. Rapid escalation to a nuclear response, though, raised the uneasy issue of the use of Japanese bases by US air power equipped with tactical nuclear weapons. Although Taylor himself doubted the value of the Japanese bases, the Joint Chiefs of Staff affirmed in 1963 that they were essential for US war plans in the Far East. And there were, in fact, as we now know, secret understandings that accompanied the 1960 US-Japan Security Treaty on the need to consult the Japanese government over the introduction of nuclear weapons to the American bases in Japan and their use in the event of Korean hostilities. Now, these, these secret understandings were actually finally made public um, by the Japanese government in 2010. 
Aside from military considerations for the wider political issue, that US-Japanese relations could be strained by a new approach to nuclear use in the Korean Peninsula, and even US attempts to base nuclear weapons on Japanese territory. If the issue was man mishandled, in other words, the loss of the bases would be a disaster for US security policy in East Asia. In terms of overall doctrine, Taylor's was a suggestion of lowering the threshold at which nuclear weapons would be employed as the State Department would it put it, seemed to run counter to our policy of fighting limited wars without the use of nuclear weapons and of endeavouring to prevent escalation. While the most likely dangers in the Far East over the coming years were low-level insurgency and aggression, and that, quote, aversion in Asia to the use of any type of nuclear weapon is so strong that such use would without question be a great political cost, unquote. The Bureau felt it was not safe to assume that a one-way use of nuclear weapons against China was possible without Soviet involvement as the Bureau of Foreign Affairs. affairs. Moreover, in an argument which would gather force in the force over the coming months, it was about that, quote, when the Chinese acquire nuclear capability, the principal Asian reaction would be fear of being drawn into a Chinese-US uh, Chinese nuclear war. So if we cannot convince Asian countries that they can be defended without resort to nuclear weapons, they are likely to seek accommodation to Chinese political demands. We'll be unable to convince them if our advertising is dealing with local aggression as a nuclear counterattack. Now, the State Department eventually responded negatively to the idea of drawing American conventional forces um, and adopting an overly, overly, overly nuclear strategy in Korea. And the rejection of this approach was conveyed in a letter from U. Alexis Johnson, Deputy Under Secretary of Political, Political Affairs, to Taylor at the end of May 1963. Johnson explained that the withdrawal of the two U.S. divisions would, would be politically unfeasible, involving as did reliance on nuclear use of nuclear weapons. In Japan, as in many places elsewhere in Asia, Johnson said, announced exclusively a nuclear strategy for <coughs> the defense of Korea, particularly when set against that policy of seeking to achieve a conventional option in Europe, would give much opportunity for unfriendly elements to exploit what could be termed a racist strategy. That is, our policy will be interpreted as a greater willingness to use nuclear weapons against non-white races. This will be peaking much greater ammunition as to African nations on, Asian, on, 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 um, on racial issues. The conclusion that all this comes to, I think, is that among senior American policymakers in the years leading up uh, from early 1963 up to the first uh, Chinese nuclear test in October 1964, was that American conventional forces designed for limited war in the Asian mainland offered the best reassurance to the People's Republic of China's nervous neighbors. The corollary to this was that the United States should not appear to be intimidated from using them when Asian allies and friends called for help. Beijing was considered highly unlikely to initiate the use of nuclear weapons, except that the mainland itself was under direct attack in a way that threatened the survival of the communist regime. Cautious probing rather than outright aggression was the pattern of behavior that could be expected from Beijing, uh, Beijing and with it will be influenced not by any false reading of its military strength, well, on a trust estimation of the psychological situation and the reactions of the United States and its allies to such tests of Western result. The United States, it was increasingly proposed, had to maintain a strong conventional capability and the willingness to deploy it. Standing by American commitments and maintaining credibility in the region appeared all the more vital then in the context where non-communist Asian states might fear the development of the Chinese nuclear umbrella in the coming years would increase Beijing's assertiveness and reduce of the United States' proclivity to employ military force in their defense. So a key consequence here of the Chinese anticipated first nuclear test was the erosion of the credibility of an American nuclear response to overt communist aggression. But now China would have the means to strike back if she was subject to nuclear attack. And the likeliest targets for any Chinese nuclear counterplay were American bases located in the territory of Washington, Asian friends and allies. This kind of reasoning made it apparent to the Kennedy administration by 1963 that conventional capabilities for limited war in the Far East had to be given even greater emphasis that the necessary sense of reassurance was to be spread around the region and as the date of the Chinese test approached. From some American officials during this period, one can see concern over how the phenomenon of the Chinese bomb might be Beijing's image of mission status, what was often termed the non-white or colored world. In Asia, the Chinese test prompted concerns that pressures were built for India and Japan two states previously most associated with anti-nuclear sentiment to create their own nuclear programs, but developed not seen to be an overall American interests. 
reassurances that the United States will stand by any state which was subject to China due to black example, or one suggestion for how Washington might fall to a school with eventuality. But a concrete willingness to confront communist power in Southeast Asia was enough. From this, it was not difficult to extrapolate that the United States had to be willing to face the conventional military power, the immediate communist challenge in Vietnam. But Beijing's ambition to drive the United States out of Asia was in most immediate, in, in most immediate in evidence. And it was those enhanced American conventional capabilities for limited war, as set in train by McNamara from 1961, which became the means by which the Johnson administration escalated its commitment in Vietnam during 1965. It was, however, not the kind of war that the US military establishment had envisaged or prepared for fighting. Though flexible response has been largely analyzed as a posture for the European concepts of the confrontation between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. There remains plenty of scope for examining its origins, backgrounds, and implementation in Asia, where a nuclear-armed China featured as the ultimate enemy. Brilliant.